Hello, my name is Teresa Stack and I'm an assistant professor with Montana Tech of the University of Montana. And this module is called The Human Spine at Work. It's a brief overview of the anatomy of the spine and how the physical workplace risk factors can impact it and also helps highlight how ergonomics is the solution to many of these physical workplace risk factors. It is part of the Master of Science program in industrial hygiene within the Department of Safety, Health, and Industrial Hygiene. I hope you enjoy the presentation. The objectives for this module are to review spinal anatomy and to understand how the physical workplace risk factors impact the structure of the spine. It is no way a replacement for anatomy and physiology. This module will also prepare you for implementing the lifting assessment tools that will be presented to you later in the course, as well as prepare you for the sampling lab where you'll use some real biomechanical modeling software. And there's a video link below if you'd like more information on the spinal anatomy. It's a really well done interactive video. Back pain can be felt in the back. It can be felt in the thoracic area, the neck, the arms, the hands, the legs. It usually originates from muscles, nerves, bones, or other joints or structures within the spine that have become impacted. Back pain may have a sudden onset or it can be chronic in nature. It can be constant or intermittent, stay in one place or radiate to other areas. It may also be a dull ache, a sharp piercing pain, or a burning sensation. My husband used to use the term hot dagger being stuck into my left leg. A pain may radiate into other parts of the body, arms, hands, legs, jaw, feet as well. And symptoms include not only pain, but weakness, numbness, healing, tingling, and sometimes a loss of mobility. Back pain is one of humanity's most frequent complaints. In the U.S., back pain can sometimes be called lumbago. It's the second reason why people call in from, call in to work sick. And it's the fifth most common reason why people visit their physician. About nine out of 10 people will experience significant back pain at some point in their lives. Significant is defined as back pain which stops you from doing your after work activities. So we're gonna take a look at the human spine. And you can see it has that natural S shape to it where it's concave at um, both the cervical area and the lower back area. The cervical area begins at the base of the skull. There are seven vertebrae in this area with eight pairs of cervical nerves. The nerves exit where two vertebrae come together. And they're responsible for controlling the neck, arms, and some of the upper body as well as the jaw. This vertebrae group is sturdy, enabling the support of the head. It also has a great amount of movement. Think about all the different orientations you could move your head and neck into. That's because the spinal vertebrae in this area have a large facing between them. If you look really closely at the picture, you can see the spinal process, which is the part that's sticking out the back. There's a whole bunch of space between the spinal processes within this area of the spine, and that's what makes it very mobile. The amount of stress placed on these vertebrae usually has a lot to do with the posture of the head, whether the ears are over the shoulders or the ears are sticking out somewhere in space when the head is leaning forward, like when you're trying to text on your phone. They're left directly below the cervical region is the thoracic region of the spine. There are 12 vertebrae with 12 pairs of ribs, as well as, ner as, well as nerve roots that control the midsection of the body. The ribs form the chest wall and protect the internal mo organs. This section of the spine is fairly unmovable. Try to move this area of your body without moving your neck or your lower back. And that's because the ribs are protecting the internal organs. And if you look really closely at the picture, you can see how the spinal processes in this area lay really flat together to kind of prevent the mobility. And it's also the way the spinal disc the way they lay one on top of the other, each plane is cordoned off in a different kind of angle that either allows mobility or stops mobility. In this area, mobility is almost completely stopped. 
The third part of the spine is the lumbar vertebrae. There are normally five lumbar bones, although some people have one more or one less. These vertebrae are the largest and strongest region of the back because they carry the bulk of the body's weight. Five pairs of lumbar nerves manipulate the movement and sensory functions of the lower extremities. The lumbar region is the segment of the spine with the most pressure on it because it's at the bottom of the spine. All the weight is placed upon it. When a person bends over, the lumbar region is asked to bend but still maintain its strength to hold the spine upright. After the last lumbar region of the spine is a mass of five smaller bones which are naturally fused together forming a triangle. This bone net mass is named the sacrum. Below the sacrum is the coccyx or tailbone made up of four smaller bones that are fused together. The sacrum and the coccyx do not look like the other vertebrae. The pairs of nerve roots originate from this area responsible for the actions of the pelvic organs and the buttock muscles. The sacrum and tailbone could be considered the basement or the sub-basement of the building of the spine. We can think of the vertebrae column as a series of fixed segments, these are your vertebrae, which are your bones, having mobile connections, and the mobile connections are your spinal discs, your ligaments, and then your muscles, of course, their contraction pulls the spine in all different directions. Movement of individual vertebrae are compounded such that the entire structure has considerable mobility in all three directions. The type and extent of mobility varies within the different spinal regions depending on the size and shape of the vertebrae body and other factors like muscle tissue um, density as well as muscle tissue flexibility. Each vertebrae is attached to its neighbor by three joints. The bodies are joined by cartilage tissue, the intervertebrae disc, and two facet joints, which allow motion. The picture shows the deep muscles of the spine as well as the more superficial muscles of the spine. And you can see that the deep muscles of the spine run perpendicular with the spine, where the more superficial muscles of the spine run at a 45 degree angle and wrap around the spine and corset it together. There are three types of back muscles that help the spine fun function, the extensors, the flexors, and the obliques. The extensor muscles are attached to the posterior or the back part of the spine and enable standing and lifting objects. These muscles include large pairs in the lower back, which help hold up the spine and help in the contraction of the gluteus muscles. The flexor muscles are attached to the anterior front of the spine, and they include the abdominal muscles, which enable flexing, bending, forward, lifting, and arching of the back. And then the loved oblique muscles, or the love handles, they're attached at the side of the spine and help with spinal rotation as well as proper posture. Clinical ev evidence supports that work-related back disorders or injuries occur most frequently in the intervertebrae just between the fifth lumbar vertebrae and the S1 sacrum area, although the L4 is impacted as well as many of the cervical regions of the spine. Cumulative damage to the cartilage end planes hampers the flow of important nutrients into the disc, and this pro provokes further disc degeneration. These cartilage end plates become damaged when you have small microtraumas that occur in the cartilage or the outer ring of the spinal disc, which we'll see on the next slide. As the spinal disc degenerates, there is an increased risk of disc failure because the outside wall is becoming more and more weakened and less likely to be able to get the nutrients inside of the spine. The vertebral discs in the spine are interesting and quite unique. Their primary purpose is to act as a sac absorber between the adjacent vertebrae. You can see in the picture the spinal process is at the top, and then you have your spinal structure, your vertebrae. Um, the yellow region is representative of a nerve, which originates from the center or the spinal core. And then you can see the spinal disc is in front of that. Spinal discs also act as ligaments that hold the vertebrae of the spine together and as joints that allow for mobility of the spine as well as rigidity. 
there are a total of 23 spinal discs, unless you've had one removed. Discs are actually composed of two parts, a tough outer portion and a soft inner core, and the configuration has been likened to that of a car tire or a jelly donut. As long as you don't puncture the outside of the jelly donut, all the good nucleus material stays inside, all the good jelly stays inside. The fibrous portion is around the outside and it acts like a corset and it holds the gelatinous or the softer nucleus material inside of the spinal disc and helps to evenly distribute the forces imposed on it given the posture that you put yourself into. The outer portion and the inner portion of the spine fit together like two concentric cylinders and are interconnected by the cartilage end plates. What's really interesting about the outer portion of the spinal disc is that small cracks can develop and then heal over time, but because the disc is hydrophilic, meaning that nutrients enter it through this hard fibrous portion, if spinal uh, cracks occur in the outside of the ring and then heal, the material gets thicker and it's that much harder for nutrients and water to get into the spinal disc. About 80% of the spinal disc is composed of water, so in order for the disc to function properly, it must be well hydrated. So if you're not really well hydrated and your spinal disc is not as plump, so it's not as full, there isn't a great separation between your vertebrae, then you have a lot of play in your back or movement in directions that your body may not consider as protective. And to protect you, your body does something really cool and it's caused which causes a lot of pain, and it's called a muscle spasm. So the muscles contract to hold the spine in place so it can't move. So hydration is something that's really important in whole body health as well as spinal disc health. The main reason for trying to maintain that neutral posture, the ears over the shoulders and the shoulders over the hips, is that so you keep that nice natural spinal alignment where you have the three curvatures of the spine, concave, convex, and concave. The main reason for keeping the back straight is that it avoids excess pressure on any one part of the spinal disc. So as you can see in the picture all the way to your right, when you're leaning forward, all the disc material, the nucleus material, is pushed towards the back of the spine. And there's an opening there for your nerve to go through as well as that disc material to fill up when you're in this posture. But you can see in the picture in the center that that's also the weakest portion or the thinnest portion of your spinal wall or your spinal disc wall. And therefore, it's more likely to be damaged when you're in this posture. A nerve provides a common pathway for electrochemical nerve impulses that are transmitted along each of the axons. Nerves are found only in the peripheral nervous system. Spinal nerves help to communicate between the arms, legs, and trunk. They are, there are 31 pairs that stem from the spinal cord. And as you can see in this picture and in the slide that follows, um, different spinal nerves enable different parts of the body to move, as well as you can see where the, if there's a spinal segment that's causing nerve compaction within a certain area, such as in your L5-S1 area, the purple that you see. That's why sciatica is a pain in the butt because it contracts the area in which the nerves follow through. So you may feel the pain or the burning sensation in the lower back, the buttocks. You can feel it on the outside of the calf or all the way into the foot. And then you can see the L4-2 is kind of in the hip area and goes into the bottom of the foot and over the top of the leg. So you can track sometimes where the pain is coming from based on where the irradiating pain is. I think this is a really good representation of the idea between referred pain, how having a misalignment in the cervical area can be causing that pain in which you might think is carpal tunnel syndrome, but really isn't. It's something due to the way the nerves are being impacted in that area of the spine. Whether it's because a disc is breaking down, a tendon is tore, or a ligament is strained, or maybe your muscles are just in contraction, 
and pulling the spine out of alignment to the left or to the right or hopefully not in torsion. Remember, your muscles work in antagonistic, protagonistic pairs. That is, one contracts for flexing and one contracts for extension. Think about when you flex your bicep muscle, your arm is contracted or flexed closer, and when you contract your tricep muscle, your arm is opened up or extended. The same is true for your spine. Your back muscles extend to keep the back upright and straight, and your ab muscles flex when bending over, and they work together to stabilize the spine. If the ab muscles are weak or not engaged during a lift, there is a greater risk of back injury because your ab muscles help to add to stability of the spine. So any damage in the abdomen region, region can lead, in a sense, to weaker spinal muscles just because they can't help the spine work so hard. Contracting your ab requires learning to flex and release these abdomen muscles. And if you do that while you're performing a lift, it helps really helps your ab muscles become stronger. The other thing you can see in this picture, although it's representative of the ab muscles, is what happens when some spinal muscles become overdeveloped because maybe you use one side of your body more or you're injured so you use one side of your body more and don't use the other side and they become overdeveloped and they can actually over time pull your spine over to one side and cause a scoliosis type effect. And this is something that had happened to my husband as well as other injuries within his spinal region. Oh, the core muscles. I'm sure we're all contracting our core muscles as we listen to our spinal anatomy lecture. In anatomy, the core refers to, in the most general definitions, the body minus the arms and legs. Functional movements are highly dependent on the core, and lack of core development can result in a predisposition to injury. The major muscles of the core are within the belly region and the mid and lower back, as well as the hips, shoulders, and some parts of the neck. So just when you look at this picture, you can think about a woman who's become pregnant, and that center muscle there, the abdominus muscle, tears apart as you become larger as the child develops inside of your abdominal cavity. And if it doesn't stitch back together or heal properly, a woman can be predisposed to back injury because the muscles aren't as strong or as tightly knitted together as they once were. And then also with a cesarean, the muscles aren't only just ripped apart, but they're cut right down the middle. The dark material you see, the pink material, that looks just like a muscle, and that's exactly what it is. But the white material that you see, that's your tendon attachment. And you can see the thick tendon attachments in not only the front or the core, well as the back as well in some of the previous slides. And how when they become damaged in some way, it takes a really long time for a tendon to heal as opposed to a muscle because there's a lot less blood flow in that area. The major muscles of the core include your pelvic floor, your transverse abdominis, your multifidious, your internal and external obliques, those love handles, the erectus abdominis, the erector spinae muscles, the longitudinal thoracic muscles, and the diaphragm. Minor muscles that are still important in the core include the latissimus muscles, the gluteus maximus muscles, and the trapezius muscles. Looking at the picture on the left, the welder, what is a no-class way to improve this situation? How about the picture on the right? Where will this dentist hurt at the end of the day? Which risk factors is he exposed to? And as a side note, if you or somebody you know happens to be involved in the dental profession and you send me an email to my Montana Tech address, I have a PowerPoint presentation with some speaker notes that's called Practicing Dentistry Pain-Free, and it may be of use to them. 
Can you see here the importance of posture, of all the physical workplace risk factors that are related to ergonomics? Posture is one that we can almost always impact to the positive, to the benefit of the worker. Sometimes force is just simply built into the job at hand, as well as repetition and duration. But posture can almost always be changed, whether it's temporarily or permanently, or you're able to go from one posture to another posture. So for example, if we can get this welder into a lower position by providing something for him to sit on, or raising up the bucket, either one is going to help him not feel so much discomfort at the end of the day. And when we look at bio biomechanics, we'll see the greater degree of flexion or extension, the more we're f away from neutral, the higher the pressure or the force on any area of the spine and therefore the higher risk of injury. Really? Does your head weigh as much as a bowling ball? Yes, really, your head weighs as much as a bowling ball. And there's an interesting YouTube video that I'll give you a chance to watch. So, the further you hang that bowling ball forward, the more pressure, the more force, the more muscle interaction that needs to take place to just simply hold that posture. Can you see the importance of airs over the shoulders, shoulders over the hips as much as possible? Somehow bringing that work piece up to the worker so they don't have to accommodate the work surface. The work surface is not going to become injured in this arrangement, but the worker will. Neck disorders. Neck problems are commonly associated with prolonged exposure to static postures where the head is either leaning forward, you can see where the ears aren't over the shoulders anymore, or the chin is tipped down. So in either one of these positions, where the ears are forward of the shoulders, or the chin is tipped down more than 30 degrees into the chest, you have a flattening of that curvature in the upper neck. And there is a lot of clinical evidence that shows that flexion beyond 30 degrees leads to rapid onset of muscle fatigue, which causes them to lose their contractile ability, as well as causes structural changes in that part of the spine. So this is the same thing that goes on in your lower back. When you sit for long periods of time, you lose that curvature in your lower back. Put your hand in your lower back right now and keep your hips above your knees. So sit on the end of your chair and drop your knees down. You see how you have a curvature in your lower back? That's what's supposed to be going on. That keeps the intervertebrae disc pressure distributed evenly. But now sit in your chair and lift your knees up above your hips. Just pull your knee up. You see how you have that flattening of your lower back? That's an awkward position. And too long in that position can cause not only back pain and fatigue, but over time structural changes. And here are those structural changes. Some of them occur because of workplace situations and other of them occur because of genetics or just our aging process. But you can see the normal disc is plump, it's full of water, um, the spinal vertebrae are separated. A herniated disc or a prolapsed disc is when the inner nucleus material is actually leaking out of the disc. Once you get to that point, really only surgical intervention will stop that from happening. And it's that leaking out of that disc material which changes the pH in the muscles and causes pain. So something like a bulging disc, you can see how there's a weakening of the outer wall and the nucleus material is starting to push towards that back. That's where that bulging disc can come in contact with some other structure like a nerve, a muscle, a tendon, or a ligament and cause pain or discomfort. These can sometimes be corrected without surgical intervention. Um, there's no such thing as a slipped disc. The disc doesn't slip, but the spinal vertebrae actually can slip. And then a thinning disc or kind of that degenerativeness of the bone material around the disc can also cause problems within this region. So now drink a big glass of water, become well hydrated, and we'll keep moving on. 
So some different disorders that can occur because of long-term exposure to certain kinds of postures. You can have kyphosis, which is the overcurvature of the upper back caused by postures, certainly indicative in laboratory situations where people are leaning forward for long periods of time. My grandmother was a seamstress, and they had this kind of problems too, where they would be leaning over their sewing machines. You have lordosis, which is the overcurvature of the lower back, and this can happen with excessive weight in the front part or the abdomen of the body. And then a lot of people think scoliosis is only a disease that would be caused um, genetically or at birth, but if you have muscles, so in this picture, if you have muscles on the left side of your body, which are overdeveloped and always used, or weaker muscles on the right side of your body, your muscles can pull your spine over to one side and cause that curvature of the spine. And this is really um, predominant in our children because their spine are still developing. And if they do something that causes injuries or they overuse one side of their body because of maybe a sport activity that they're in, they can get this scoliosis. And the way you can correct all of these is through good physical conditioning and balancing the muscles which are out of balance. In spite of the back's capacity for strength and mobility, it holds us upright, makes us completely functional. There are several factors that can make functionality um, lead to pain or discomfort or, in some people, disability. Some individuals are born with spinal abnormalities, such as scoliosis. My husband has spondylolisthesis or curvatures. This can be complicated by what we do in children as well as what we do when we get older. As our body ages, the tissues may undergo changes. Some of these changes reduce our capacity to adapt to stress and strain in our body or more likely to cause us injury. There is a high prevalence and incidence of back pain in the United States. It's one of the reasons why it's very hard to nail down, and actually we never will have an ergonomic standard in the United States. But think about why so many people have this background level of back pain, regardless of the job they do. Anytime you start up a new activity, you're likely to experience pain or discomfort in this area, either acutely or chronically. So if you've never snowboarded before and you snowboard for the first time, for me it was like being in a car accident. Or overuse, the cumulative effects of body body postures over long periods of time, as well as misuse using one particular body region and causing an imbalance, the right side becomes stronger than the left, or you're always leaning forward and you're not leaning back enough. And then the last one is really sad because this is where you really get that cumulative nature of things breaking down in your body, and that's that disuse. When people hurt, they are less likely to exercise and use their body in ways in which the body helps to aid in um, natural recovery and your muscles start to become weaker and your muscle spasms can become greater because you lose your degree of flexibility and your range of motion. So getting people back to work as soon as possible or having them in some kind of program where they're encouraged to use the muscles even though they're hurting in such a way that doesn't cause them extreme pain can maybe lead them back from injury. And I am not a physician, but we all know well that the longer somebody's out of work, the more likely they're going to stay out of work for longer and longer periods of time. And when you hurt, it's really hard to exercise and use any part of your body because you don't want to hurt more. This is obviously very personal to me. My husband's had two back surgeries. After the first one, which you see in the picture on your right, um, he was 70% disabled, meaning that most of his day was spent laying on the ground, laying on the floor, so he would be straight and his back would decompress, which is what happens when you lay down or hang upside down like on an inversion table. And it completely changed the life of me, my children, and of course most significantly Michael himself. And then years later now, 
Um, so six years later, Michael still experiences back pain. We have about every device you can imagine to alleviate that pain without the use of narcotic drugs. And he calls himself 80% enabled instead of 20% um, disabled. And really prevention is the only solution for um, spinal injuries. The first one would be when you have that feeling of fatigue or discomfort or pain or you see it in your workers that is not relieved by rest within a given day or interrupts after work activities that we need to change those physical workplace risk factors. And I'm urging you to focus on posture because posture is almost the easiest one to correct. And then there's physical therapy which can help strengthen muscles which are weakened and hopefully give time, time as well, time for tendons and ligaments to heal after any kind of injury. There's holistic um, medicine that you can use, like acupuncture works really well, chiropractic work, um, over-the-counter as well as prescription medicines all have their own risk. If pain is not relieved, then you can go to steroidal injections, which helps to sometimes alleviate the inflammation, although there's problems with those types of medications as well. Cauterizing is used when you have a disc which is bulging but not completely prolapsed, and you can kind of cut it off and heat seal it so that the bulge doesn't occur anymore. This can be done almost as outpatient. And finally, you're kind of coming to the bottom here. You see a spinal fusion at the bottom, which is what my husband has, as well as disc replacement surgery. And I'll warn that back in 2008 when my husband was looking at spinal surgery, disc replacement surgery was on the cutting edge, and it was really effective for the C1 through C7 area, the cervical region, but only 30% effective in the lumbar region. So I'm not sure if that has changed over time, but it wasn't really the way to go. But maybe in time we can all be the bionic man. Certainly my husband is the half a million dollar man. I call him that. So thank you for listening to this short and kind of an overview of spinal anatomy just to get us familiar with the different structures again, what we've forgotten in case we haven't had anatomy and physiology in a long time. And if you take the time now, there's a couple of videos there out of Moodle which explain a hovercraft repair operation and it gives you an opportunity to take a look at some different kinds of risk factors that are present in the workplace. You have a wonderful day.